All right, so um, what we're going to talk about today is precedence imaging. Uh, and I'll explain what that is. Uh, I emailed you just now uh, a CAD file that you can use for the project that I want you to work on over the weekend, okay? So, but let me demonstrate the concept first, okay? Now, to, to hear this, you really are going to need to get out of your seat and position your head directly in front of that subwoofer, <laughs> okay? Like you want to be right in the middle of these two left and right loudspeakers or you won't be able to hear what I'm trying to show you, okay? So give yourself, so like seriously, Laura, like you got to be oh. <laughs> right here, okay. somewhere along this line, okay? okay. So Does distance not particularly, okay? okay? Um, all right, so what I have here is just panning, okay? I'm just going to pan left and right, okay? Blue, so, blue, uh, here we go. And I'd okay, so that be should be left, right? Yeah, and yes, then this should be right. I'd so you hear me panning, right? Okay. And then so, and what you should notice is as I pan to left, the right channel meter goes out over here on my thing, right? So there's no sound coming out of the right one. And when it's in the middle, sound is coming out of both of them equally. Okay. When I go over to the right, sound is coming out of the right one all by itself, but not coming out of the left. Okay. Now I'm going to do it a little bit differently now. So now I'm going to pan it to the left. Feeling wild and free. Okay, so it should sound like it's coming mostly from the left now, but notice the sound is coming equally out of both loudspeakers still. Now I'm going to pan it over to the right. Okay, so now it should sound like the sound is mostly coming from over to the right, but the sound is actually coming equally out of both loudspeakers. Okay. Are you hearing that? Yes? Um, yeah. Less on the right yeah. channel, but yeah, when it was left, I totally got the imaging. Okay. Yep. So um, I'm not saying this sounds the same as the first panning I was doing, right? I'm not saying it sounds the same. I'm just saying that the second time I was doing it, you should have been getting a sense of the sound moving from left to right. Yes. Okay. So what's interesting about that is we were getting a sense of the sound moving from left to right, but I was not changing the level of either of the two speakers. Okay, so how is that possible? Delay. Yeah, so what I was really manipulating was time. Okay, what I was manipulating was the time that it took for each loudspeaker to arrive at your ears. Uh, the first example, when I was panning, I wasn't changing the time, okay? This, both loudspeakers were arriving, arriving your ears at the same time. All I was doing was changing how loud they were. And so by making one louder than the other, it gave, gave you a sense that the sound was coming from the one that was the loudest, okay? Uh, what I was doing the second time was I was keeping the level the same and I was just adding delay to the loudspeakers. So if I, when I was panning all the way over to the left, uh, I was adding delay to the right channel so that the left channel loudspeaker was hitting you first. Both of them were hitting you at the exact same level. It's just the left one was getting there first. Uh, and when I moved it to the right, I was delaying, instead I was delaying the left channel so that the right channel was hitting you first and the left channel was coming later. Uh, this is called the precedence effect. Okay, so you can get back to your seat now. Um, What's, this is, what this has to do with is uh, this sort of blind spot in our hearing system that we've developed. Uh, and, it has to, and the reason that we can do this is because of early reflections that we learned about, uh, I think, last time, right? Uh, and remember, early reflections are reflections of the direct sound that happen you know, within the first 30 milliseconds or so. Well, really could be a little bit more than that. It's really reflections that have only reflected off of one surface, really, is the early reflections. Could ha they could get there more than 30 milliseconds later. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, we have developed this blind spot in our hearing that allows us to uh, compensate for those reflections. So when you're hearing a reflection off of a wall, 
you know, usually the reflection is not a whole lot quieter than the direct sound was. Okay? And as we know, what happens when you hear the same sound at more or less the same level, but a slightly different time? Comb filtering, Comb filtering right? That was like you know day two of this class. So we know that. When you hear the same sound more than once, but at a different time, but the same level, comb filters. And pretty much every sound you hear has reflected off of something. You're hearing it, almost every sound in your life, you're hearing at least tw two times uh, at more or less the same level. So why have you not been walking around your entire life sounding like the world is comb filtered? Because our brain yeah, so because this is something you hear all the time, our ear brain systems have sort of figured out how to compensate for that. So if those reflections happen, well, remember when we were playing with comb filtering and I showed you what it sounds like when it happens on a wire as compared to when it happens in the air, mm -hmm. and we realized when it happens in the air, it, we could sort of deal with it a little bit better? Yeah. Okay, that's, so that's because we have learned to deal with this. So uh, what, we've, what we've developed is this ability to hear it ha hear a sound more than one time, and if it happens within a certain window of time, then we can sort it out. Okay, we can we can compensate for it. We, in other words, we don't process the comb filtering. Is that why, like in this room, it's like you're talking and it's whatever? But like if you're in like an echoey room, you like hear echo because that's a little bit different. So that's not comb filtering. Uh, what's what? That's something different. I'll get to in a second. But uh, if it happens, if you hear that, those reflections within the first 30 milliseconds or so, then your ear brain system will not process the comb filtering, will also not recognize that second sound as an echo, mm -hmm. right? So you won't feel like you're hearing double. Instead, what you'll feel like is that the sound is louder, mm. right? 30, 30 yeah, if, it, if you get early, any early, early reflections that happen within 30 milliseconds of the direct sound, is gonna you're gonna you're gonna perceive that as just it's louder. Mm. Um, you're not gonna he feel like you heard it twice, and it's not gonna sound like it's comb filtering. Okay, and that's just that's your brain. Your brain just processes it that way. Okay. Uh, now, if those reflections happen, if there's more than a 30 millisecond gap between the first sound and the reflected sound. At that point, you know, you'll start feeling like you're hearing it twice. Now, it could be, depending on the type of sound it is, it could be as, you could start hearing double as early as 20 milliseconds. If it's like a drum, it's really, really transient or percussive sound, you, you, you're, you'll start hearing echo around 20 milliseconds. But for the human voice, you can usually push it as high as 30 and, and, and not feel like you're hearing double. But much past 30 and you'll start ba -doom, ba -doom, ba -doom, hearing it twice. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're talking about, which is you get in a really big room and you start like hearing, you hear like a slap off of the wall and stuff like that. That's because the reflection is arriving more than 30 milliseconds after the direct sound. Mm -hmm. And you know, that is sort of the time window that our ear brain systems have sort of recognized that, well, we can just lump that that's together. enough of a difference. Well, that's enough of a difference that I'm not sure it should be lumped together, right? That's what your brain is thinking is that if the second thing you hear is more than 30 milliseconds oh, I was later. Talking about like the less than 30 yeah, minutes. so. It's just like, we're good. We're going to just. Oh, it'll sort that out. Um, but more than that, it doesn't understand. Yeah, so if, if you get past that 30 milliseconds, then, it's, then your brain is, is kind of thinking, well, that's enough of a difference that I'm maybe not sure about that. Sound. Maybe that is a second well, sound. Yeah. Maybe I should not. Maybe I should like pay attention to that. Um, unfortunately, that does affect intelligibility, right? If you feel like you're hearing double, all the time, that's going to affect your ability to understand what you're hearing. Okay, so we don't like those kind of reflections. Uh, and from the acoustician's point of view, the acoustician will try to either remove those kind of reflections or somehow shorten their path mm -hmm. uh, to get them out of that echo zone. That's so true because I'm thinking about like whenever we're in the triad stage lobby, mm -hmm. we all have. I'm like really loud, like yeah. naturally, so I have to talk like so quiet uh -huh. because it's so echoey in there right. or whatever that it like everything is so loud in right. there and like you can hear it in the theater. It's like whenever I'm in there and there's a show, I'm like talking like right. this because I know that like somebody's going to be like, You're too loud. Right. So, um, so that's, that's, our, that's how our brains work. Now what is interesting about this is we have realized that we can fake that effect, like we can, you, we can exploit that. So the demonstration I just gave you is, is really called the Haas effect. There was a guy named Haas that wrote a paper about this and he was, 
he was playing around with stereo imaging using time as opposed to level, right? So most stereo imaging of left-right sort of positioning of stereo image is accomplished through level. Okay, they just mix the same sound into both loudspeakers at slightly different levels, and they can manipulate sort of where you perceive the direction from that way. Mm -hmm. And what he was writing about was you can mess, you can't, you can do the same thing using time. So if you can slightly modify the time between the two, the sound going into both the loudspeakers, you can also play around with the positioning. Uh, and that's pretty effective because you know we're super sensitive to changes in level and time that happen on this horizontal axis because that's the way our ears are loaded across our head, right? We can hear that difference much better. We can't hear the difference as, as easily when it's on the vertical plane, okay? So uh, if you take that same effect and flip it vertically, put one loudspeaker on the floor, one up in the air, uh, it actually ends up working better because we don't, our, we, our ability to kind of figure out what direction the sound is coming from on the vertical axis is harder for us because whether it's on the floor or on the ceiling, it still arrives at both ears at the same time. And so figuring out where that came from is harder for us. But the precedence effect still works. So even though you have a hard time f you know, figuring out where that came from, you still get that effect of, I'm not hearing an echo, and overall it sounds louder because I'm hearing it twice and you get the sum of the two uh, intensities. Okay, uh, So that effect works even better on the vertical axis and we can utilize that to our advantage. Why would we want to do that? Well, um, if you think about somebody standing on a stage talking to a microphone that comes out of a loudspeaker, uh, in some cases, it's perfectly fine to have that sound un unnaturally loud and coming from the ceiling, right? That's maybe okay for a lot of situations, but in some situations, maybe not. You know, if, uh, there are plenty of situations in theater, for sure, where um, you know you don't want it, the actors' voices to sound like they're coming out of the ceiling where loudspeakers are. You want it to sound like it's coming from where that actor's standing. Mm -hmm. um, you're trying to create the sense of a small space, not a large space. Uh, that's not true for every show, and I think that's something you need to understand. That I'm not, I'm teaching you this not to say this is what you should do every single time you ever put a microphone on somebody in the theater. I'm just saying that this is a tool in your arsenal if it makes sense artistically, right? If if whatever the style of the show is and the theater and the what you're trying to do, uh, maybe you don't want the sound of the loudspeakers coming from the ceiling. Uh, and if you don't, this is a way to get the best of both worlds. This is a way to get the benefit of the increased sound level uh, as a result of the acoustical gain without sacrificing the sense of the sound coming from the actor. Okay, So in this case, what we can do is we can, instead of using two loudspeakers, we can say, I'm going to use one loudspeaker and a talker. And my talker will be the first loudspeaker, and my loudspeaker from there will be the second thing. Right? And if you can make sure that the talker's natural voice arrives at the listener first, Okay, so hopefully in a theater, their voice will get to all the seats at, in some, at some level, maybe not as loud as you'd like, but hopefully if you just don't even turn the house system on, they will hear some of the actor's natural voice. And if you can make sure that whatever they hear of the actor's natural voice, if that arrives first at their ears and the sound coming out of your loudspeaker arrives second, and it arrives within 30 milliseconds of the nat their natural voice, then guess what? That loudspeaker can, can sound louder to the listener. The listener can, can hear the sound from that loudspeaker that it is louder than the actor, but if it's less than 30 milliseconds of time between when it heard the actor, the listener will think that all of that sound came from the actor, came from the first thing they heard. Okay, So the actor just sounds louder uh, and it sounds like it's coming from the actor, right? That's a pretty cool effect. Uh, there's some some limits to this. You can't really push it much more than 10 dB. So there can't really be more than 10 dB of difference in level between that first sound and that second sound. If you get more than 10 dB, then you know you'll your your brain will sort of think, okay, well, the thing that's coming from the ceiling is quite a bit louder than the first thing. So maybe it's meant to be a different thing. Mm -hmm. And it, you'll start to kind of perceive it coming from up in the ceiling, even though the timing is, is you know, different. OK, so you can't push it much more than 10 dB. That's one of the limitations. So let me show you how this works. 
Um, so I just have, uh, this is the Stevens Center, right? And I have in here the center cluster, right? Uh, this is the, just the house center cluster right. loudspeaker that's up there. Uh, and I've just kind of marked out some spots here. Uh, seat A, B, C, and D. This is just front and back row for orchestra and balcony. And I've plopped a little point here where the singer or talker would be standing. And I just want to show you how you might be able to figure this out. Now, one of the one of the kind of guiding principles of this is really you want this to be able to work at every seat in the theater, but every seat in the theater is a different distance away. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the sound will arrive at a different time. And if you're trying to manipulate time and get things to arrive in the same order, trying to get that to work for, in this case, 1,400 seats could get really complicated. Okay. However, generally speaking, if you can make it work in the front row, and you can make it work in the back row, usually it'll work everywhere in between. Yeah. Okay. Uh, very rarely have I run into a situation where that wasn't the case. Okay. So you don't necessarily have to sort this out for every single seat. You just have to kind of think about what are the extreme edges here, right? You've got the front row, which is the closest seat to the stage, and you've got the back rows, which are the farthest seats away. Uh, and if you can make it work for there, it ought to work everywhere else. Okay. So I've just I'm just doing front row, back row for you know both the orchestra and balcony. So we're going to do this the you know just manually here with the CAD file. Uh, Next week, I'll show you how you can play around with this in Lara. Uh, now, I have I kind of preloaded some of this, but I'll, I'll build it from scratch here for you. And I but I just want to show you kind of what I'm doing. The first thing I did here was I measured the actual distance of the singer to each of those four seats. Right. So how far away is the singer from the front row how far, of orchestra? How far away is the singer from the back row orchestra? How far away is the singer from the front row balcony? So on and so forth. Then what I did is I said, OK, how much time will it take for the sound to travel that distance? OK, so for example, if the singer is 17.8 feet away from the front row, it will take a sound 15.78 milliseconds to travel that distance. And that's just the distance divided by 1.13 feet per millisecond, which we've learned before. OK. Next thing I did was I said, OK, the distance of the center cluster loudspeaker to those seats. Right? How far away is the center cluster to the front row orchestra? How far away is it to the back row orchestra? So on and so forth. And then I did the same thing about, well, OK, how long will it take the sound from that loudspeaker to get to those seats, given that distance? Okay, and so for this scenario with Stevens, are you doing it on each seat based on Whichever loudspeaker it's closest to being like on access to. In, yeah, and this, given that this center cluster has more than one loudspeaker in it, that's kind of what I did. Um, and you won't always have that though. You know, yeah. Like the project I'm giving you is just this one center cluster, right? So you'll just do it from that one. Uh, so then, what I did then was in here, I said, okay, I took the time that it takes for the center cluster to get to that seat, and I subtracted the time it takes for the singer's voice to get there. And if I end up with a positive number, like here, where I got 15.692, that means that the singer arrived 15.9 milliseconds before the sound from the center cluster. Okay. And in this case, where I see a negative number, that negative 14.9 and negative 15, what that means is the center cluster arrived 15 milliseconds before the singer, or you could say, the singer arrived 14.9 milliseconds behind the cluster. Okay, so in, so if you see a negative number, that means the loudspeaker is arriving first. Okay, we're, so we're just subtracting. We're just saying the time at the center cluster sub minus the time for the singer to get there. And if you get a positive number, that means the singer arrived first. If you get a negative number, that means the loudspeaker arrived first. Okay, we want the singer to arrive first. Okay. And then what I have here is I've just got a cell here for delay I could apply to the loudspeaker. So if your loudspeaker is hooked up to some sort of digital processor that allows you to add delay, in other words, it just sort of holds on to the sound for a little bit before it lets it come out, then I could factor that into my equation. So here, now I'm saying uh, the center cluster minus the singer 
plus the delay I've added to the, to the center cluster. So if I just add some time to this, like what if I added 10 milliseconds? Well, now the front row and orchestra and the back row orchestra are OK, because they're a positive number now, but the balcony's still not. So I need a little bit more delay. So if I go 15 milliseconds, OK, now it works. So now the front row has the singer arriving 30 milliseconds before the loudspeaker. That's good, right? 30 milliseconds is that line that we don't really want to cross. At the back row um, balcony, it's basically arriving at the same time. Uh, but the singer is arriving just slightly ahead, um, less than a millisecond. So they would ideally, you'd want more than that. Uh, but there's just a geometry issue here that's preventing that. OK, so let me show you now. I'm gonna, I'll clear this out now and show you how I've, I did all of that. Okay, so let me just go to a new tab here. Uh, and this will be the seat. So I'll have A, B, C, and D. And this will be the distance. So singer distance. OK, so let's just go over here and measure some of these things. So I just want to know, what is the distance from the singer to the front row? 17.8377 feet, right? So I've already scaled my CAD file to be decimal feet, just like we did with Laura. OK, so now what is the singer distance to the back row? 76.6187. Okay, what is the distance of the singer to the front row balcony? Otherwise known as seat C, 58.0259. Okay, and distance to the back row balcony? 100.1141. OK? So that's how far away the singer is to each of those seats. You with me so far? Yep. OK. So now I'm going to figure out, well, how long will it take for the sound from that singer to get to those seats? In other words, what is the time? And in this case, I just need to take this distance value and do what with it? Uh, you said divide by 1.13. Yeah, divide by the speed of sound per millisecond. And sound travels. 1,130 feet per second or 1.13 feet per millisecond. Okay, So I can just do a formula here. If I just put equals, then I can select this cell and say divided by 1.13. Okay, And it'll give me a value in milliseconds. And then this is just a cool little trick. If I just take this handle and drag it over there, it'll just copy that formula over to all the other cells, and then I don't have to put it in. And it automatically increments the cell for me. OK, so that is the time that it's going to take for the singer's voice to get to each of those seats. So it's going to take 88 and a half milliseconds for the sound of the singer to get to the back row balcony. OK, all right, so now what I want to find out is, OK, how far away is the, is the loudspeaker from each of those seats? Sorry, one question. Yep. The ease value, well, the distance, that's whatever. Does the time, mm -hmm. that's the value for their natural voice to get to mm -hmm. okay. yep. How long will it take for their voice? Because we know that sound takes time to get where it's going. And the farther away you are, the longer it takes to get there. All right? Uh, classic example of this is if you ever go to a baseball game and you're sitting back at, you know, at center field and you see the, the batter swing the bat. And then a little bit later, you actually hear the sound of the bat hitting the ball, right? Have you ever noticed that? That's because the light that reflects off the bat that lets you see the swinging the bat gets to you faster than it takes the sound to travel to you, OK? So we know that, that sound is slower than light, OK? Uh, all right, so let's say, we'll, I'll call this the center cluster distance. So how far away is the center cluster? 
Um, in this case, I have three. It's a cluster, so I have three different loudspeakers. So I'm just going to pick whichever one's closest to each seat, which will be this downfill will be that one. So that's 35.5778. Center cluster to back row, that's going to be this one, 74.3523. Center cluster, I'll do the middle one to the front row here, that's 46.7059. And then to the back row balcony will be this top one. And that's going to be 83.292. Okay. And then this will be center cluster time. So now I want to know how long will it take for the sound from the center cluster to get to each of those seats given these distances. So same deal. I'll just say equals that distance divided by 1.13. Okay. And then I'll copy those over. What's that? Okay. I have no idea what this program did. All right, so uh, it's a math program. <laughs> now, uh, what I want to find out now is what is the difference in time between those two sounds when they get to those seats? So, you know, if the singer, singer's voice arrives 15 and a half milliseconds after it makes its noise at the front row, and the center cluster arrives 31 and a half milliseconds at the front row after it's made its sound. Now, what's the difference in time? So if I'm sitting in the front row, how much time is there between those two sounds? Because that's what I want to know, right? I want to make sure that those are happening in the right time, in the right order. So the best way to figure that out is to say I'm going to take the center cluster time minus the singer time. And that'll just tell me the difference between those two times. Okay, so this will be the center cluster time minus the singer time. Okay, and that's 15 and a half milliseconds. Positive, which means the singer's coming first. Could have told you that just looking at the CAD file, right? The singer is closer than the loudspeaker is. So the singer will get there first. Okay, not so clear here at the back row balcony. Okay, the singer and the center cluster are pretty close to the same distance away, right? We can see that if we look at the sorry, if we look at the thing. I mean, you know, the center cluster is 73, 74 milliseconds and the singer's 88. So the singer's a little bit further away. So it's not going to quite work the same way. So let me just copy this over and we'll see. Yeah, so see all over here at the back row balcony, I got a negative 14.8. What that means is the center cluster is arriving 15 milliseconds before the singer's voice. And that's not good, right? We want the singer's voice to arrive first. So we know we've got an issue here. So let we, we see that. We say, OK, now I want to add some delay to my center cluster in order to sort this out, make to fix this. So I'm going to make another little cell here. And this will be center cluster minus singer plus the delay that I'm adding to the cluster. Okay, and that should sort it out. So I'll say this will be, say equals center cluster time minus singer time plus that. Okay? That's 15. So just we'll just test this out. So if I add a 10 to this, now it goes up to 25. See that? Now here's just a, a little tip. Watch what happens if I copy this over like I've been doing. Okay, it doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Why are these still negative? Well, because look, it incremented that last cell so as well. So it increments all of them. And this is supposed to be H2, but it's K2. So it's trying to do the delay off of this. You understand what happened? So what I have to do, there's just a little thing you have to do. If you, want, if you don't want it to increment a certain cell, you just have to put little dollar signs in front of it. So I'll just say dollar sign $h, dollar sign $2. And if you do that, then when you do that cool draggy thing, it won't increment that particular value. It'll just keep that one static. OK, so here I go, boom, boom, boom. And 
they're all responding. So now if I change this value, if I put it up to 20, for example, they all change. So putting it up, if I had 20 milliseconds of delay to the center cluster, that means I'm actually going to hear an echo at the front row, you see? Because it's 35 milliseconds. So that's no good. So I can't do 20 milliseconds. If I do 15, I'm close. right? So I can just barely make this work, given these distances. So if this was my only option, then I would want to do one of two things. I would either want to move that singer so that the singer was arriving at a slightly different time. Uh, for example, I could probably move them further upstage, uh, and that might help. Or I could move my center cluster, right? That would help. <laughs> I could get it to be physically in a different spot relative to the singer, then the geometry would work a little bit better. OK, but we can make this work. This will be just barely working. Where you know they're, they're coming just barely first at the back row balcony, okay? Not even a millisecond, which is not ideal. Uh, in re in reality, I may want to even push this to 17 and just maybe hope that <laughs> there's enough of a difference in level at the front row to not hear that echo. I have a question. Yep. Um, so, how does this work? Like you were saying about moving the singer or whatever. Yeah. How does that work when you've got like a bunch of people on stage like walking around and yeah, they aren't so be in the place that you tell them because you're not the director? Yes. Okay. <laughs> good. So that was exactly the next thing I was going to try to tackle. Is that so? We can just barely make this work if the singer never moves, <laughs> right? If we can make them stand in one spot, and we can we can put a little tape mark on the floor, spike mark, and say, okay. Stand here for the whole show and never move, then this will work. Well, you know that's not going to happen, right? They're going to move all over the place. Uh, so, uh, yeah, what happens if the singer moves? It'd be the same thing that we did for front and back row of the house, but with the stage and the singer. Yeah. Okay. So we need to kind of figure out well, where is the area on the stage that they're going to be moving around? What's the extreme edges of this? And if we can make it work for those, you know, the extremes of those two things, then it ought to work everywhere in between. So let's just see what would happen there. So uh, right now I've got my singer all the way downstage. So I'm going to make a copy of my singer at another location. Come on. I don't know why it won't let me select that. Oh, there we go. So uh, generally speaking, you can kind of make, I've just, this is just a rule of thumb. I can, I can usually only make this work in about a 20 foot area. So if they're moving around in an area that's more than 20 feet deep, then you got to figure something else out, OK? Um, so what I usually do is I just put a singer all as far downstage as I think they're ever going to go. And then I make a copy of them 20 feet further upstage than that. Okay, So there's the singer 20 feet further upstage. Much, if they end up spending a whole lot of time upstage of this 20 foot mark, then I have to do something. And we'll talk about the doing something later if we get that far. But for now, try to keep it within about a 20 foot acting area. Um, and this is sort of a, you know, depending on your capability to respond to this kind of a problem, I, the conversation I have with the director usually is, you know, well, I usually don't even tell the director unless the director notices, hey, when they're standing all the way upstage, it sounds weird. And I'll say, yeah, it sure does. It, they would sound less weird if they would move five feet further downstage. And if the director says, oh, great, I'll move them five feet downstage, then problem solved. They say, well, I can't move them five feet downstage. Is there any way we can make them not sound weird? And your answer is yes or no, depending on your capability to make that adjustment. But if you can't, and you say, no, it's just, that's just how it's going to have to be when they're upstage. Um, or if you can, then fine. You, you know, you, you, there's the thing you can do. But, uh, but you don't need to get feel like you have to constrain the director. But if, but if they notice that, hey, they sound weird, weird when they're upstage, then I just say, yeah, they sure do, don't they? And, <laughs> and if they ask me, well, how could I fix that? I say, well, you could move them downstage. But generally speaking, I found that you know there's usually scenery upstage, right? Yeah. Okay, so they're not usually singing a whole lot, really far upstage. Yeah. They usually the singing usually happens at the downstage area. 
just generally. So you don't run into this problem too often. Uh, OK, so I'm going to relabel these guys, because now we've got a downstage singer, right? And now we have an upstage singer position. So we've got to change our spreadsheet now. So um, let's see. I'm going to insert a couple of cells here. So this is our downstage singer. And now I need an upstage singer distance. Okay, so how far away is my upstage singer from each of my seats? Upstage to front row, 37.5652. Upstage singer to back row, 96.5615. Stage singer to front row balcony is 76.5919. And upstage singer to back row balcony is 118.3059. Okay, and now I just need to convert that to milliseconds. So take distance. Divided by 1.13. Boom. All right, so um, I need to relabel this. This is for downstage singer. This is for downstage singer. And now I got to do the same thing for the upstage singer, don't I? So if I just copy these. Put it down there. So center cluster minus downstage singer is really going to be oh no, it did work. It did it, didn't it? This is going to be upstage. And that's going to be upstage. Let's just make sure it tracked. Yep. Oh wait, no. I need it needs this one needs to be ah, I'm just gonna redo it. So center cluster minus upstage singer is center cluster time minus upstage singer time. Yeah? I'll copy that over. And then this will be center cluster time minus upstage singer time plus my center cluster delay. And I'll do my little variable again, dollar sign, dollar sign. And we'll copy that over. There we go. OK, so I'm just going to uh, fill in these ones that we're interested in just so that we can make sense out of all of this. OK, so those gray rows are the two that we care about, right? So we know it works for the downstage, but it it's, doesn't work when they're upstage. Look at that. So when they're standing upstage, the loudspeaker is arriving first. So I need to add more delay to my cluster, don't I? So my worst case scenario here is that 14 milliseconds in the back row balcony. So how much delay would I have to add to my center cluster in order to get the singer to arrive first at that back row balcony when they're upstage. Well, it's all so it's if it's 14 now, I need to add at least 14 more milliseconds, right? It's 17. Yeah, I know. I've got 17 milliseconds of delay right now, and with the 17 milliseconds of delay, the center cluster is oh. still arriving first at back row balcony when they're standing upstage. So how much more delay do I need to add? Well, at least 14. But ideally, a couple more than that, right? So that they're arriving first. So if I say 17 plus 17 is what? 34? Mm -hmm. Is that right? 
So if I say 34 milliseconds, well, that fixes it, right? So now the singer is arriving first, three milliseconds before the loudspeaker. But uh oh, when they're standing downstage, the front row person is hearing the center cluster 50 milliseconds after the direct sound. No good, right? That's going to sound like an echo. So this is the problem. The actors aren't allowed to move. If they move, it doesn't work. The wireless mic is just attached to the actor, right? <laughs> so that doesn't, that doesn't help. Uh, so we need actors that don't move, is what we need. Or interactive board off. Well, yeah, so we or could. Everyone yeah. to sit on stage and to eliminate. Yeah, everyone can sit on a stage. <laughs> or, yeah, we could, if we could add delay, different delay to every microphone, oh. right? So if we had, if every microphone, we could change the delay, we, the, changing the delay in the microphone would effectively move the center cluster forward and back, OK? So if we could somehow keep track of where they were on the stage and add or subtract delay from their microphone to move the loudspeaker further away or closer to the then we could do this, right? Yeah. So it becomes tedious. that'd be really complicated, yeah, well, right? It's like, OK, every time they move, we have to figure out how far they are away now from everything. And we have to add, make a cue on the board that changes the delay for their mic. Um, that, sounds that would be like, hell. that. Uh, it does. That would be really That's awful. Terrible. OK? That would be pretty awful. Interestingly enough, there are some systems that will do that for you. So uh, there's a company called Outboard out of the UK that makes a, a system called Timax. And Timax has a tool that's like a radar grid that oh, you put over the stage. The and you put trackers on, you put little radar <laughs> trackers on the actors. And it will keep track of where they are on the stage. And you put variables into their delay processor that says, well, if they're this far away, then add this delay. And so, and so it keeps track of all the actors and adds the uh, Super expensive. And actually, I don't know really how effective it is, but, but it works. All right, but in reality, what we really need is an actor that doesn't move. Okay, that's the simplest problem. The simplest solution is they can't move. Right? That's never going to happen. Never going to happen, right. But we could pretend like they're not moving. Okay. Can you think of a way that we could pretend that they weren't moving? <laughs> Go from center? Well, I don't know. I'm think about what is the role, what is our loudspeaker doing? What is its role in this whole thing? Trying to get the sound. To the sound of what? The sound of what? The sound of the actor's right. voice. Right. Yeah. So the the loudspeaker is like another copy of the actor's oh, voice. So you're saying we should just delay the loudspeaker. Or well, no, we did that already. That's what we were doing in the center cluster. What I'm saying is we already have set up a, a universe where a loudspeaker can pretend to be an actor. Right. Oh, Phil. That's what we're doing, right? Phil. We have, a we have a center cluster that's pretending to be an actor, right? Because the sound of the actor's voice coming out of there. Well, why can't we put a loudspeaker down here on the stage that also pretends to be an actor, but it doesn't move? <gasps> this is the real reason why we do front fills. It's not actually to fill in the front. That's sort of you know a nice side effect. Mm -hmm. But in this particular situation, for when you're doing musical theater reinforcement and trying to do a present effect, you're really using the front fills to pretend to be actors that are on the stage that aren't moving. Mm. OK? And if they conveniently also help the front couple of rows, that's great too. But the primary reason you would have them is to be actors that don't move. So then like, does that become, when you're like doing delay, does that become like your actor's voice? Or are you still going Yeah, I'll show you. So, um, so I'm just going to make a little point here that well, actually, let me do this. Um, I'll copy this one, then I can have a label. So I'm going to put a little front fill right here on the edge of the stage, a loudspeaker. OK? So new loudspeaker, we're going to put it right there. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pretend 
that instead of my, this, is, this being my center cluster, this is now going to be a front fill. We're going to pretend for a moment now that the center cluster doesn't work, right? that it's not there. So our only loudspeaker is the front fill. So we know that if we have the loudspeaker up in the air and the actor is moving around, that doesn't work. So we're going to now put the loudspeaker on the stage uh, so that it's in the same place the actors are, and it's not moving. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the distances to all the seats will be about the same, right? Between the, the front fills and those actors, those distances will be relatively uniform. Right? There won't be huge differences in time. Right? The actor's voice will arrive at, at each of those seats at around the same time as the front fill arrives at each of those seats, because they're in the same more or less physical location. Mm -hmm. okay? So let's just see how that works. So if I change all of these to front fill, this is front fill, front fill, Front fill, front fill, front fill. OK, so what I need to do now is just change these distances, right? I need to measure the distance of my front fills now. So if my front fill is to front row 16.5795, and by the way, I'm going to set this back to 0. Um, distance of front fill to back row orchestra is 76.4509. OK, distance of front fill to front row balcony is 59.6670. And distance to back row balcony is 101.8048. OK, look at what's interesting about this. All of those values on both of these gray rows are within a millisecond or two of each other now. You see that? Mm -hmm. They're all negative because the, because the front fill's arriving first because it's physically in front of them all the time, right? But whereas we used to have a, a range between 0 and 30 at each of those seats, now we have a range of 0 to 1. Or you know, the biggest value we have is 18, smallest is 14. So there's only 4 millisecond difference now at each of the seats between the singer and the front fill. Isn't that interesting? Because they're in the, both the loudspeaker and the singer are now on the same plane. They're both on the stage. And so the distances are more or less consistent. So now, if I go in and add some delay, what's my worst case scenario here is that 18 milliseconds, right? So if I say, if I put 20 milliseconds of delay on my front fill, look at that. These all become positive numbers, and they're all less than 30, right? Biggest one is that is that 21 milliseconds, but that's that's less than 30, so that's within precedence. The smallest one is that 1.42. Ideally, you want it to be at least five milliseconds to help compensate for the comb filtering, but it will work if it's less than five. So if I just put this at if I say 24 milliseconds, then that puts this one at five and a half, and it puts this one at 25 and a half, and those are still all within precedence, right? That's all within the 0 to 30, or the 5 to 30, which is your ideal. OK, problem solved. They can move anywhere they want to move within that 20-foot range on stage, and every seat will hear the actor first and the front fill next. OK, so we solved that problem, but we've now created a new problem. Have you spotted it yet? What's our new problem? So why is that a bad thing? Level throughout the house. Why, is it, why would level throughout the house be a problem? Because I'm assuming it's probably going to be like an E3. We're going to have a huge level drop. Yeah, but E3s are pretty loud. Okay, I mean, an E3 is like, what, 110 dB at one meter? That's huge. But distance from front row to back row is going to be way more than 6 dB. Yeah, but so is the actor. Well, we don't want that. That's not the point. Well, no, what I'm saying is the actor will decay at the same rate as front fill. Right? So if the front fill is if the front fill is 10 dB louder than the actor, 
it's going to be 10 dB louder than the actor at the back row as well. Yes. So you're still getting the increase in level. But your overall level from back row to front row will be far more than a 6 dB range. Yeah, but you can't have it be more than 10, 10 dB anyway, remember? Not but I'm not referring to between front fill and, and the singer. But that's all we care about. I'm referring to what the listener is hearing in front row and back row. We would want more consistent level in the house. Well, sure, but we can never be more than 10 dB. The loudspeakers can never be more than 10 dB louder than the actor, yes. or precedence doesn't work. Yes. OK? OK. I I'm not sure what you're asking at this point. So I'm saying you're on the right track, but you're not thinking about the right thing. OK? okay. So fills. the point is the loudspeaker will be louder than the actor, yes. right? And the front fill is in the same place. Yeah. And so it will consistently be the same relative level between the, the singer and the last speaker, okay? And we can't ever be more than 10 dB, yes. or we break the precedence, okay? The real problem here is game before feedback. Uh, okay. Because now the last speaker is super close to the microphones. Uh, if they're wearing wireless microphones, and the last speaker is now really close, we may never even get that 10 dB, uh, right? Because we now have the, uh, an acoustical gain problem, yes. okay? That's the real problem, okay. all right? Uh, so in that case, we actually don't need to get any gain out of the front fills. Think about it. Because all the front fill is trying to do is be an actor that doesn't move. So the front fill can be the same level as the actor, and it will still do its job. Right? Because it will still get to all those seats at the same level as the actor does. And that's all we need it to do. So we get our 10 dB with something else. A center cluster, right? We, we add another loudspeaker now that gets us our 10 dB, and it's farther away from the microphones, and therefore we can get that gain out of it. Okay? okay? That's that's the that is now the new problem we've created is because we put the front fills on the stage, we now are limited in our in our gain. So we still need our center cluster. Use the center cluster to get the gain, and the front fill to get the image. Okay? Uh, so here's the cool thing about precedence effect. It doesn't work for just only two sounds, right? You, it'll work for, you can hear the same sound several times. And as long as each time you hear it, it's, only, it's less than 30 milliseconds from the, from the last thing you heard, you will sum it all back to the very first thing you heard. So you could hear the actor first, and then a front fill, at least, you know, less than 30 milliseconds later, and then a center cluster less than 30 milliseconds after the front fill, and then even a b under balcony fill, could, could, you could hear that as long as it was less than 30 milliseconds after the center cluster. And at the, by that point, now you're at total of 90 milliseconds, right, after the actor, which you would normally hear an echo, but you don't because of the other two arrivals, because you heard the front fill and the center cluster in between there, and you, get, you sort of, you get to leapfrog this precedence effect. Mm -hmm. So the under balconies image to the center cluster, the center cluster images to the front fills, and front fills image to the actor, and therefore mm -hmm. it all images to the actor in the end. Okay? So let's put our center cluster back in now. So let's do center cluster distance again, center cluster time again. So we'll measure these again. Actually, we don't need to because I have them. So center cluster distance is here. I'll just copy them back from the other sheet. OK, and center cluster time will be that divided by 1.13. OK, and now I need, what I want to find out now is, the difference in time between the center cluster and the front fill. Because now I've got a precedence image sorted out for the front fill. I don't have to worry about the actor anymore. So all I need to find out now is how much time is there between when the front fill gets to the, to the listeners and when the center cluster gets to the listeners. And I want to make sure the center cluster is always arriving less than 30 milliseconds after the front fill. Because if I can do that, then it will all ultimately get back to the actor. So all I need to worry about now is center cluster minus front fill. 
you with me? OK. So this will be center cluster time minus the front fill time plus the front fill delay. Right, because there's del I've added extra time to the front fill. Okay, so I just need to compensate for that in my thing here. So it's center cluster time minus front fill time, including the front fill delay. So there's that, and I'll do my little variable thing here, my little dollar sign, so it tracks. Do do do. Is that right? No, because I think I actually need to do, it's minus the front fill, isn't it? Yeah, that works. So I have, to, I have to say it's center cluster time minus front fill time minus the extra delay of the front fill. Right? I, was, I was adding the delay of the front fill, but I really need to subtract it, because that's extra delay I'm subtracting. Okay, so. Center cluster minus front fill minus front fill delay. And that gets me a bunch of negative numbers, which I don't want, right? I want positive numbers. I want the front fill to arrive first. And right now, the center cluster is arriving first because it's physically closer to the seats than all of them when you count the front fill delay. So now I need to say, all right, I'm going to now delay my center cluster. So this will be center cluster minus front fill minus FF front fill delay. And I also need to do, it'll be center cluster plus center cluster delay, minus front fill, minus front fill delay. OK? So this will be equals center cluster time plus that minus front fill time minus that, OK? And these ones need to have dollar signs on them so that they'll track. And that's for, the, for these cells over here with the delay? Mm -hmm. and, that, and all that does, what does that do when you do the dollar sign? It just, it just means that when you then copy that cell over, it doesn't increment the reference to the cell. Oh, because when you do it above, uh, like without the delay part, it just, the so, reason that it works is because it just adds like the cells. Yeah. So to see, when I go over here, this starts, at, you know, this is saying B13, but when I go over here, it's incremented it to C13. Okay. I see now. Right? Okay. Okay. So, uh, I just wanted to make sure that these are the same. They are. So now I can add delay. So how much delay do I need to add to my center cluster in order to make this work? Well, the worst case scenario is that 40 milliseconds, right? I would like that to be at least 5 milliseconds in a perfect world. So how much delay would I need to add to my center cluster to turn that negative 40 into a plus 5? 45. 45 milliseconds. So 45 milliseconds on my center cluster. And we are just about there. Although it looks like that's off. Why is that off? Minus H2. I think that's off because of this. It's these distances. And this is this is just a little little trick here, but if you think about so where would be the overlap between these two 
loudspeakers. In other words, where would that 6 dB down point overlap be? What are they? Well, it's going to be halfway between, right? I mean, I'm going to set it up yes. so that it's halfway between. OK? So it's you know, somewhere around here. So what's interesting about this is, what is the difference in distance here? So that's 53 and a half feet away. And that is 53.3. So it's not quite so bad. Um, and then the same thing here, there'd be a little bit of delay. What I'm saying is that ultimately, uh, these bottom ones are going to end up getting delayed a little bit when we tune this cluster, because we want them all to kind of, when the overlap, we want them to kind of be the same. Yeah. OK? So what ends up happening, what might work a little bit better here is if we kind of use that spot for our center cluster so it's a little bit further back. Because given that they're all different, we're ultimately going to delay them separately when we tune this thing in order to get the overlaps right, which means the whole thing's going to be a little bit further back in reality and time. So if, if, I, if I assume that, let's get new distances for our center cluster and see if that fixes it. Uh, 41.492. So. And this one will be 80.21, 80.215. This one oops, will be 52.3435. And this one will be. 89.1174. OK, so that means I can take some of this off now. And I'm getting close there, aren't I? So if I go to 37, 35, oop, I'm getting close. So what we're learning here is that that's a, not a great center cluster location, right? I can't quite make it work, just given the geometry of the space. So we're either we're, we either have to make a we have to make a couple different compromises. So either we end up with, let's see, in order to make this one work, we're potentially going to hear an echo in the front row, right? So we can either be OK with that and just say, well, hopefully, the singer in the front field, there will be enough of a difference in level there that you won't notice this huge echo, which is it's true. Like that, that'll probably be fine. Because you know, you're know you going to shade the level of that downfill anyway, because it's so much closer. Yeah. OK, so it's going to arrive a little bit quieter anyway than everything else will. So you could sort of hope that that will work. Or what would be the other solution? Move your front fills. Move my cluster, really. Yeah. So if I could move my cluster to a slightly better location, yeah. then that would make this work a little bit better, too. So for example, if I, what if I hung a truss and put my center cluster sort of down here, right? Or maybe even a little bit further down. Maybe I could hang it down there. And I change these distances. Let's see what happens. So new center cluster distance is 32. Well, 32. So this will be that. And this will be that, so 76.489. And this will be 50.6687. And this will be 90.0996.
Hey, we're getting closer now. Look at that. So if I go to 38, 39, 40, oh, look, we just made it. Now we're within 5 to 30 milliseconds everywhere. So I will say I've tried it both ways in this space. Um, I have tried hanging a cluster down under like that, and I've tried using the eyebrow. In fact, the last time I did a, a musical in here, I used this cluster like that. And this actually worked. Well, I just had to, I, I didn't hear the echo so much, but, uh, but to do that, I really had to get a lot of mileage out of those front fills. What I did was I aimed the front fills really high um, so I could push them much hotter and get a lot more level out of them uh, without blowing these people away, oh. right? And then it, there, there was enough of a, a level differential there that I wouldn't notice the echo so much. By pushing them up to get more gain out of them throughout the rest of the house, though, aren't you losing potential gain on stage since you're becoming closer towards the axis? Yeah, but okay. not significantly enough to okay. worry about it. Um, <laughs> So th what, this is all by way of saying that the easiest place to hang your loudspeaker is not necessarily the best place to hang your loudspeaker, <laughs> OK? And there are a lot of reasons to like say, OK, well, if I took the extra time and effort and maybe expense in hanging a, a cluster in a different spot, then I could make this timing thing work out quite a bit better. Okay, so it's not just where is the easiest place to hang it that gives me the easiest, most even coverage. That's not the only concern. You might, it might be better to hang in a different place, get a slight different last week that covers a little bit differently so that it'll work in a new spot. Uh, this, this gets easier and easier the lower I can drop this center cluster. Okay, so if I could, if I could drop this even lower, if I could put it down here, it'll get even easier to make this work. Right, the closer I can get that center cluster to the stage, the easier it'll be to make the timing work. Right in front of the set. Yeah. So, you know, this is why, like if you, you know, if you talk to a lot of the people who do a lot of musicals in these kind of theaters, they're always fighting to get their center cluster lower and lower and lower, and this is why. Mm. Um, like when we did Guys and Dolls in this space, and, and Drew Levy was the sound designer, he, he fought really hard to get that cluster as low as he could get it. And he had to burn a lot of political capital to make that happen. <laughs> At Lyric, they just, the designer that I worked with there, he fought one, his first yeah. year there. And then every year he was just like, yeah. they won't listen to me. But that's why. That's why. <laughs> the lower you can get it, the better the timing works. Now, of course, the lower you can get it, the closer you're getting to the microphones and you're potentially getting into a gain situation. Uh, but that's, all, that's the main reason why a lot of them will then hang big line arrays there, because yeah. they can really control that vertical pattern and get a lot, a lot of sound on the stage, so their gain goes up. So uh, it's just like a constant, like... Nothing's free, yeah. right? Every, for everything you gain, you lose something else. <laughs> so you just have to decide what's the thing you want the most, OK? Uh, and I will tell you, the last show I did, I just didn't have the time and the labor to hang a cluster under there. And I just say, you know what? We've got this new cluster in here. I'm just going to see if I can make it work. Yeah, because you know? the thing is you can make it work. It's just like, yeah. how does it sound? Do you yeah. know, like, how are you willing to live with however it sounds? So I, I tell you the ultimate solution to, to fixing this. Can anybody think about it? Like, if I had to put that cluster there, and I had to use it, and I absolutely did not want to be in that echo situation, what could I do? Could you add in something lower? No, no. no. Could you change the? There's no chance of changing anything with that cluster. Okay, so that not touching. I'm not going to move. I, I'm not going to move the cluster. Literally uh, at all. You, would you re-angle any of those? Okay. I wouldn't re -aim them. So without touching that. Yeah. What could that, you do? I could delay each of these separately. Ah, I wouldn't have thought of that. Right. Because my problem is, if I delay these all the same, 
to make the delay work here puts this put it, puts it where, too far away for here. Where would you delay to? Well, I would just I've got a separate delay on each one of these. They're on, going through a separate app. Oh, I so I put I put more delay on the top one than I put on the bottom one. Okay. <laughs> now that causes potentially this overlap to get weird. Yeah. Right? Because now that's not perfectly not coherent. But who cares? My whole system is completely incoherent on purpose. Yeah. Right? <laughs> So I, I, that, this is a compromise. So, you know what? I will give up that perfectly coherent overlap there, that perfectly 6 dB down point lined up phase line thing. I will give that up if it means I don't hear an echo in the front row. And the whole <laughs> purpose of this, like of delay itself as a concept, is to just get the image to the stage? Yeah. OK. So this last time I did this was, you know, we did, I did, Pibon Opera was doing a little night music, the musical. It was this year, last year, I think it was? Last year. Um, and they absolutely did not want the sound of the sound coming out of the loudspeakers. Like, they wanted it to sound like it was coming from those singers. It's, yeah. th that's just their, as an opera company, that's their aesthetic. I mean, their people are, their audience and for that wants show, that. Too. Yeah, their audience wants that. They don't want the sound of, you know, a loudspeaker. They want the sound of a, a singer's voice acoustically in a space. Yeah. So that was like priority one. Was it, you know, yes, we want some gain, but we, we don't want it at the sacrifice of a, a, a perceived natural sound, right? Because is it just like the idea that, like, you're, you're, like, you're, you're, you like listening up instead of listening yeah. out? Yeah. And like, I guess. So it's yeah, like you, you see it happening just, down here, but you hear it happening up there, and that there's a disconnect there. Yeah. Okay. Right? Okay. If you can not have that happen, then that would be nice. Right? Yeah. Now, if this is like, you know, Rock of Ages, right. the musical, who cares? Yeah. Right? I mean, imaging doesn't matter yeah. <laughs> in a rock musical. Right? But, but, you know, an older Sondheim piece? Yeah. It doesn't matter. Or a Rodgers and Hammerstein yep. 1950s musical? Yeah, I mean, that aesthetic of natural voice in a space is probably important for that, that style of show. Yeah. OK? Uh, so this is not the solution for every show. Right, yeah. But it is a solution for some shows. And it's a pretty cool trick, right? You can get the benefit of the extra delay. Now, remember when I said you can't go more than 10 dB? Well, that's 10 dB per sound. Did you say you so, can't go more than 10 dB for the microphones? No. At the listener, they're going to hear the sound multiple times. Each time they hear it, it can't be more than 10 dB louder than the last thing they heard, oh, okay. or the imaging doesn't work. Fine. The imaging goes up. So you could have the singer arrive, and then you could have the front fill arrive 10 dB louder if you could swing it. All right, if you can get that much gain, you could have the, t the front fill arrive 10 dB louder, and then you could have the front fill or the center cluster arriving 10 dB louder than the front fill for a total of 20 dB of gain, and it would still image back to the singer. That's harder to accomplish to make that 10 dB, that, that full 20 dB work everywhere. But that's where something like under balcony fills could come in handy, right? So you maybe not be able to get the full 10 dB of gain out of the cluster, but maybe you can get 5 of dB, and you can get the other 5 here. Because maybe you are getting a full 10 out here in, f in clear view of the cluster, but you get further away, and you can't get the full 10. So you get the, the rest of it with a little delay fill so that the people back here are hearing the same level as the people in the front. That's why you would then put fills in like that. OK? So what I want you guys to do over the weekend is I've given you this CAD file. Not this one. It's a different one. I'll show you. So the one I've given you is, let's see. Um, this one. So this is the Friedman Theater. And I have a front row seat and a back row seat. I have a downstage singer and an upstage singer. And I have front fills, and I have a center cluster. See that? So I want you to figure out how much delay do I need to add to the front fill, that E3, and how much delay do I need to add to that center loudspeaker in order for these listeners to hear that precedence effect, to always hear the singer first. Okay. And I just want, I want an Excel spreadsheet just like I just made. Okay, so you, that's all I want is, because you're all going to be working off the same CAD file mm -hmm. with the same distances. So 
we should be able to load up, just pull up the spreadsheet, look at it, and see what's going on. Okay. So we're just trying to make it like as perfect as possible. Yeah. Do exactly what I just did. Okay. So the ultimate answer is how much delay on the front fill and how much delay on the center cluster. That's that's what that, those are the, there's, those are the two numbers you're trying to find. Uh, but to find those numbers, you got to find a whole lot of other numbers too. Yeah. You just have to do that with these two. Numbers. Yep. So you're well, going to well, make. We only have one speaker, so we don't. Have no, to you have two. You have front fill well, and center I mean, cluster. Like, sorry, for the center cluster, it's just. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to worry about that array thing. Yeah. Um, so you know, you measure the distances of the singers to, to those two seats, and you measure the distances of the loudspeakers to those seats. You convert all those to time. Do the math on it. Figure out the differences. See what kind of delay you need to add to the loudspeakers. Because really, the, what you're effectively doing here, if you think about it, is you're taking this whole by adding delay, you're just mimicking the effect of the whole sound system being further upstage. Mm -hmm. Right? That would be the other way you could solve this without delay. It's just move the loudspeakers always so that they're always behind the actor. Right? But you can't usually do that. So, but that's what you're doing. It's moving it all back. And that's how you could compensate, for example, if, you, uh, if they end up going past that 20-foot mark up here, then all you would really need to do is add extra delay to that person's mic for that scene. And that would effectively move the whole sound system a little bit further upstage for that person. Mm -hmm. Okay, And then when they move back downstage, you just take that delay away and it moves the sound system further back up again. Um, okay? This file is in the, it's like this, I just did like a measurement and it's 10 foot 11 and 11. And yeah, so if you don't like that, you can scale it okay. to decimal feet. Okay. Um, when we're done, can you show me one more time how to do that? Yeah. No, I've got one minute, so I can show you this. So remember, you're going to say, uh, first of all, you're going to go to uh, format your units, and you want those to be decimal. And right now, it's decimal inches that I'm, I'm talking about, right? So I want it to be decimal feet. So I just say scale, oops, select objects, all, base point, 0, 0. Scale factor, 1 12th, 1 divided by 12. And you zoom in, and now you're in decimal feet. And my points are huge. Mm -hmm. So I can modify my point style. Instead of 12 units, I'll say 1 unit. So they're only 1 foot big now, again. There you go. Now I'm in decimal feet. All right. That's it. We're done.